This talk is the impact of student choice on content adoption, delay on course outcomes. I am Ryan Baker. Uh, despite this being the industry track, I'm not actually in the industry as much as a partner of industry. Um, I apologize on the behalf of Lolita who had travel issues, which I think you might have heard there was a snowstorm, and Al Essa who was uh, going to give this talk but was told recently that he was going to also be in a panel at the exact same time across another room. So I'm going to do my best here and I apologize for any inaccuracies. So access to instructional materials. It seems plausible that if you don't access your instructional materials, it's probably not a good thing, right? If you don't open your textbook, uh, in fact, um, in work with David Lindrum a couple years ago at EDM, my lab found that actually if you don't open your textbook even before the course starts, you tend to do a little worse in the course. And yet, despite this, a lot of students don't buy their textbooks until well in the semester. And why delay? Well, there's multiple reasons. For some students, it might be procrastination. You know, they're going to get to it tomorrow. Um, other students might be just trying to decide what course to take, and they don't want to buy a $300 textbook or course account when they don't even know if they're going to take it for sure. Um, for some students, it simply comes down to the fact that they don't get their financial aid check until two weeks in the semester, which is a really great way to make sure that students aren't going to spend that money on textbooks. They're going to spend it on more important things like pizza. Um, one solution some people talk about is give students free accounts for the first two weeks, and in fact, McGraw-Hill does this. But even getting students free accounts for the first two weeks doesn't solve the problem. Some students get their free account, but then they let it lapse for several weeks, and then they kind of come rushing back later. So the research question is, does lack of access to the instructional material impact student performance? And how much? And in what situations is it more problematic? This is in the context of Connect. Connect is a learning environment for students and instructors. Uh, it's used in higher ed classes. Uh, specifically, um, last year it was used by 2.6 million students with 145,000 sections. Um, 2.4 students uh, purchased it and 818,000, sorry, 2.4 million students bought it right at the beginning of the semester. So they've got their textbook and their instructional materials right from the beginning. 818,000 students got the free courtesy access for two weeks. Of the students who get the free courtesy access, a little more than half actually buy the textbook in less than two weeks. Another 20% buy it in the three days after those two week, uh, that two-week mark, and 26% happen after that. So there's a significant chunk of students who uh, get access, but then they uh, let it lag. Among this data, um, when we uh, put together a, bar, um, a histogram with the number of purchases versus the days since the start of the semester, uh, you can see that there's a few people who actually buy before the beginning of the semester. Unlike the work that I did with David Lindrum a couple years ago with Sumo, these students aren't buying until the semester starts. That's probably because uh, Sumo works with uh, providers like Southern New Hampshire where students actually know what textbook they're going to have before the semester even begins. Uh, whereas in this case, um, students often don't learn until they come to class. Um, and you can see that there's kind of, a, most students buy their textbook kind of at the beginning, but there's kind of this distribution that kind of goes, um, and you know, you have 14% of students who don't get access until two weeks in the course, some students don't even get access until the 26th day. You can see from these graphs that show how many days since the start of the semester, and the students score on the course, that in fact, if you wait longer, you don't do as well. It's not shocking, right? For one thing, uh, if you don't have the textbook for three weeks, how can you do your first assignments very easily? Um, this is a slightly different pattern depending on whether you uh, take the score on all the assignments and count as zero, the ones they never turned in, or uh, just say what is their average on the assignments that they did. But even if you say what's the average on the assignments they did, you're still seeing lower performance among the students who didn't have the textbook. If you look at all the assignments, you can see it, that you have this stronger pattern because they can't do well on their first assignment. Similarly, if we look at how long students delay, they get free access, but how long do they delay in actually paying for it and getting access to the rest of the semester, you can see that, um, in this case, again, it's the same pattern of kind of a little bit lower performance, even on the assignments they did, but a much lower grade because there's assignments they didn't do. Now, at one level, this might seem obvious, but there are some things that are interesting about this. 
because what this partially tells us is that these students might actually be doing better in the course if they had their textbook earlier. We don't know. That's not true of everybody. This is not causal. For one thing, some of these students may not have gotten the textbook because they have personal problems. But there may be some opportunity in looking at the, uh, the difference between this graph and this graph to make a difference. In order to compare uh, what students' grades were between different subpopulations, we take Cliff's delta. Um, essentially, Cliff's delta is a non-parametric alternative to things like Cohen's d for effect size measures. Um, and it essentially says how often the values in one distribution are larger than the values in a second distribution. It's a little more robust to things like outliers. It's a little more robust to uh, nonlinearities in your data. So we uh, compute the Cliffs delta for each of the combinations of possible start delays and conversion delays. So we're going to compare students who delayed to students who didn't delay. And part of the idea here is we can see that there's a pattern where delaying is associated with worse outcomes. But part of the question is how much of a delay matters. Um, so we compute Cliffs delta measures for all the student scores with start delay less than or equal to a certain amount versus greater than a certain amount where we can vary A by the number of potential days. Uh, we find the start delay that results in the maximum cliff delta's value. Um, we also do the same thing where we're looking at not the same cutoff, but different cutoffs. Students who are shorter than a certain cutoff versus students who are longer than a certain cutoff. Um, and we do the same process for the delay in converting to full access, buying the textbook. I'm not going to talk about stat tests here, and the reason is because the, the data size is enormous. Everything is wildly significant. If we did a post hoc test, even if we did bone ferroni, everything is wildly significant. That's why I'm talking about effect sizes. So, for example, if we take students with a start delay that's less than 12 days, the median score um, on all the assignments is 74%. If we take students with a start delay greater than 12 days, the median score is 63%. So, we're comparing students who didn't have the textbook at all for 12 days or less to students who didn't have the textbook at all for, 12 more, for more than 12 days. Cliff's delta, 0.17. These can be interpreted the same as uh, Cohen's d. So this is a small effect size, but it, it's non-zero at the same time. If we compare, uh, say, students who got the textbook in the first three days to students who had more than 12 days, uh, we're looking at a difference between 77% and 63% with a Cliff's delta of 0.2. A couple things to notice. These effect sizes aren't huge. These are in the small zone. They're still non-zero. But the practical difference is pretty big on the average. Even though uh, it's not that many standard deviations different, we're talking 77% uh, versus 63%. A student who got a 77% is probably going to be, depending on your grading policy, a high C or a low B or even a mid B. A student who's at 63% is kind of close to the failure line, or in some courses, under the failure line. So in other words, uh, if you get your content quickly, now, that's a good thing. If you wait more than two weeks, it's a problem. In terms of uh, conversion delays, that's when a student who got the free access then waits to actually buy the textbook. And if they go more than 14 days, they lose access. Um, if you take a student who had under 19 days before they actually got the access, which would mean that they were missing access for just under a week, and if assignments are weekly, that might mean that they kind of just barely come in under the wire to not actually miss an assignment. And you compare this to in more than 19 days, you see a difference between 74% and 64% on the assignment grades. Cliff's delta 0.14. If you take um, conversion delays under 16 days, which again is within a realm where they probably still have time to do, they didn't miss any assignments, compared to more than 22 days, which is a realm where they definitely miss an assignment, you're seeing a difference of 74% versus 60%, Cliff's delta 0.19. Again, if you purchase access to your textbook, uh, there is a, there is a, there's a benefit to students who don't do that in time. Um, if we look at more extreme values, um, stu um, taking students uh, who, for example, got the textbook in the first three days and got access to the textbook within the two, just over two weeks, and doing 77% versus people who either didn't get the textbook at, uh, in three days or waited more than 23 days to get access once they'd gotten the free access. You're seeing a slightly bigger cliff's delta of 0.25, a 
a difference between 77% and 60%, and so on. Uh, the more extreme you look at these uh, differences, the more you let people delay, the bigger the effect gets. So the idea being, you know, just to kind of, I feel like I'm being a little repetitive here, but students who have the highest performance in their courses access the course materials in the first few days after the start of their class. Uh, this corresponds to previous results showing that earlier access to textbook materials matters. If they do uh, get the free courtesy access, they're more successful if they convert to the full access before they lose access to content. And students tend to do the poorest when they wait for two weeks or more to uh, obtain access to content, and then they let the courtesy access lapse for two weeks or more before converting. Um, and it's worth saying, you know, I've given kind of average grades, but in fact, some level, it's not the 14 points that matter so much as how many people actually fail their courses. Failing a course, as most of this room, I'm sure, is already aware, has consequences. Um, you don't get the credit you paid for. You might uh, lose financial aid. So if we compare students who get the textbook in the first three days and, and convert if they uh, do get the free access in under 15 days to students who wait at least two weeks and then wait three weeks, uh, there's a um, <coughs> odds ratio of 2.44 between uh, failing the course. So you're 2.44 times more likely to fail the course if you, if you waited this, this delay. So what's being done about it? it? You know, at some level, these results aren't shocking, but they're useful to know because they make a justification for, uh, for actually doing interventions and trying to help support these students. So one intervention is set up inclusive access, where students have access from the beginning of class. McGraw-Hill already does give two free weeks at the beginning of the semester from their online textbooks. Not everybody does that. Uh, that was kind of an early response to this kind of evidence. Another thing is that the college can immediately purchase the textbook at the beginning of the semester and then refund the cost if the student drops the course. So in other words, rather than requiring the student to get a check, then go buy a book, which may delay more than two weeks, you can just automatically buy the book, but then if the student doesn't stay with the course, you just automatically refund it. So you're still kind of in the same situation of, this is not a, a way for McGraw-Hill to make more money, it's a way to make sure that people have the access at the beginning so they're less at risk. You can also work with instructors to emphasize to students the importance of getting access to the course material from the beginning. Um, and you can try to nudge students to buy the product when the courtesy access lapses. So uh, MHE is working on all three of these. Here's an example of a flyer that goes out these days based on these results. I, it's a little fuzzy up here, I apologize. But when students don't get access to digital learning materials on day one, their grades suffer. It shows the average score for students who get access to the materials on day one, day seven, and day 14, including the 1.5 times higher risk of failing. And uh, here's another, uh, this really isn't coming out on the screen, I apologize. Uh, this flyer, um, Talks, it gives kind of the same results, but goes into greater detail about, the, about what's going on. And here's a flyer for students that can, can contain some of the same material that explains these results and tries to show day one, day seven, day 14, what the student's average grade is and what their odds of failing are. Other interventions that are ongoing are actually sending emails to students. When uh, So McGraw-Hill doesn't know directly who didn't get the textbook yet, right? That's a hard thing to do. You have to get that information from the instructor or the registrar. That's not typically available. But once a student has signed up for free access, you know how many days it's been and how much risk they are of uh, having it lapse. So you can say, you know, on the day that it lapses, that the student, um, you can say on the day it lapses, hey, you should, retain, you should get your access back. You could say it again two days later, seven days later. Um, a pilot study was done after this paper was uh, submitted and uh, was accepted. A pilot study was done actually doing these kind of emails, and it showed a small, uh, but well, everything statistically significant again in this big a data set, but it showed about a three percentage point improvement um, in students getting the access when they needed. Uh, although it turned out actually that the effects on grade were hard to calculate, because the, ones, because the students who ended up getting that access turned out to be from the bottom of the distribution. Um, and so it actually changed the distribution of the two sets, so the analysis is still ongoing to see how that actually affected student grades. So 
Thank you all. I apologize again for any in clarities in my presentation, um, and I would be happy to answer questions to the best of my ability. So uh, you, you opened up uh, mentioning that uh, students might be procrastinating, and that would be it. So it would seem kind of that the effect sizes sort of have two or more uh, partitions in it, and that some of your individuals are just, they, the students who procrastinate getting their textbooks are also ones that might procrastinate and study, for example, later on. So how do you know, is there any way or any window into sort of partitioning out that effect? What is textbook and what is symptomatic of the student's behaviors? And that's exactly what happened when we tried to an analyze the, the results of the intervention study, was that some of the, pe that some of the people did end up getting the textbook earlier but they were actually kind of, uh, turned out to be at the bottom. It actually lowered the average grade among the people who did get the textbook. So when you add to the people who get the textbook, you know, in 14 days, these people who were, all, who were kind of the procrastinators actually brings down the average among those people. So even though it might have actually brought up their average, it brought down the average of the group, which is part of why analyzing it's so hard. Now as for how you tease that apart, that's really difficult because you can't really self ask a self-report on that, right? You can't say, um, hey, are you a procrastinator or did you not get your check yet? Um, you might be able to tease that apart now that I think about it um, by actually looking at their t tendency to procrastinate on the assignments even that they do. Um, I will take a note about that because we could look at that and that might be useful. Oh, you got it? Thank you, Otto. Awesome. Yes, ma'am. I'm not aware of that. I would, I would hypothesize that when a resource is completely free, um, it's going to eliminate one of those two reasons. It's probably actually going to magnify the effect, because then, right now, you've got two groups of people who are, uh, who are failing to get resources. The ones who are non-diligent students and the ones who don't have the money to get the resource. When you take out that second group, you're probably going to see an even bigger effect for people who don't access their stuff on time, which might magnify the effects of a nudge. Because a nudge is not going to actually help somebody who doesn't have the money to buy their textbook. So largely, we're trying to push on the people who don't have access because they, um, because they are procrastinating. I, I think that in order to fix the problem of people not having the money, we do need to think about uh, models where, again, the student doesn't have to pay for the textbook if they drop, but they get that textbook paid for right at the beginning rather than having to wait for a check. That's just a model that is, it, it is designed by no fault of any of the people involved to push out the students who are financially struggling. You, you might be a little cautious even if we do look at, at the later procrastination things, because a lot of times this is also indicative of students who are trying to work one or two part-time jobs or more or take care of family. Um, and so that, that window for studying looks like procrastination, but it's, it may actually be a highly organized person. It's true. It's hard to. It's, it's a really challenging problem. It's hard to tease out between those two groups. Um, you could ask questionnaires. Uh, financial aid status is one of those things that it's hard to really negotiate at this kind of scale, of getting access to that information because it's sensitive information on people. Um, I, and, but it is part of why it's hard. Why we've why we've seen as we're trying to analyze the results of our causal intervention, how hard it is to actually tease that apart. It's a great point. Chris. Uh, these posters sure look to apply causation to me. Um, well, they do have that arrow there, right? <laughs> um, so I, this is hard, right, for our community in general to tease apart what's causal, what's correlative. And uh, this one's probably even harder because this is vendor and money involved, right? But it's hard enough for those of us who are doing this with OERs or, or something to try and tease it apart. How, how can we? Do you have thoughts on how we might be able to design an experiment, to study, or dig into it to try and get around some of those challenges? Well, I'm, so I think you're talking about the challenge of how to communicate in an honest fashion. And I, I think that this, these flyers are made in good faith. I do think that there's probably some portion of this result that's causal and some portion that's non-causal, that it's a complicated story. There's a trick when you communicate things to end users about communicating correlations versus causations. 
communicating things. I mean, you were you and I were in the uh, the methods laboratory block yesterday, yeah. and um, the issue of the sensitivity of communication that we want in communicating amongst ourselves as researchers is probably higher than we want with communicating uh, to end users. If you make things too complicated, it may, it may undercut the effect you're looking for. This is a serious challenge. I mean, you look at the work by, um, by Dweck or Jaeger or all the folks doing the mindset work, they're essentially, to my mind, teaching a misconception about human neurobiology in order to achieve better results for kids. They're improving people's lives by teaching a misconception. That's you know, lying is a powerful form of teaching, too, right? <laughs> we could lie to people and uh, have them struggle, right? This is uh, uh, to try and understand uh, the lie and apply the lie and learn. Uh, I, I don't, by the way, I want to say, I don't see this being in that category. This is no, maybe I, somewhat I, I, simplifying a story that is partially probably causal and partially non-causal. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm probably stating the obvious, but the presentation before you about early uh, prediction and your Actually, not in this specific work, uh, but yes. In our work with in Lindrum et al. 2015, we were looking at uh, time of access to textbook. And that was not the purchase uh, or the kind of getting access. It was the actual when do they look at it as one of a few very early predictors. Uh, the answer is I think that access to e-learning resources, whether they're open or non-open, is one of the things that should be in these models. It hasn't historically been because it's typically in a different data silo than the kind of data that you guys were talking about. And the second observation was that, uh, <coughs> which I thought was very astute of you, was the boundary between the threats. So there's probably a certain set of uh, software threats in that particularly one for those boundaries. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you had looked at that sort of stuff. In terms of, you mean in terms of some population in terms of demographics or those factors, or? In terms of uh, uh, the correlation. <coughs> Again, I'm, I apologize for being a little slow no, on the uptake. No, I'm a little slow on the uptake today. I'm a little tired. But if I think you're asking about whether there are some groups that are more vulnerable, yeah. and not in our data here, but kind of in uh, kind of the groupings that make up the population, the answer is we don't have that data handy. Uh, that data would be hard to get for this for the sample. But it's really valuable, and I do think that in some other work, Jack on Ocompile asked a question earlier has done some work at looking at the validity of models again across different demographic groups, and it, it is a really key question worth of, worth investigation. Thank you. Just a question. You know, you are talking about, about buying books, but buying books, I understand buying books, you know, it's not buying books. In this case, it's online. It's online books with uh, exercises. Okay. And, and you're talking about open open university yeah. courses where the forms are especially uh, essential. Like I think that that's one of these things. It's context matters, right? A lot of these courses are at universities where it's a live class. The forms may not matter as much, but yeah, we have to get all the. the this is one piece of um, of the data puzzle, which is especially salient to McGraw Hill as the organization that is making these uh, online textbooks and online problems uh, for people to do. Uh, that's going to be what, you know, that's going to be what uh, this group can analyze. Uh, a group that has form data will analyze form data. There's a lot of different indicators, um, and we should be working together more as a community. Part of the trick with that is, of course, that there's, these systems aren't always integrated, right? Um, the students who are accessing, I don't know what happened. The students that are accessing Connect um, very well may be using Canvas, Blackboard, Moodle, uh, Piazza, or... Or, who, or nothing for discussion forums. So is it dependent on the subject? Um, 
I believe so. It wasn't in here, but uh, no, actually, I don't think that was analyzed. I was getting confused with a talk that Nick Lukow is giving later today where he finds that some indicators of performance and problems are more indicative in, in the problems in the system are more indicative for hard science classes than they are for social science or humanities, but we have not analyzed this specific issue in terms of domain. Well, just, obviously, yeah. And it's probably true that there are some classes where uh, access to the textbook also doesn't matter as much. Uh, possibly dom areas where the instructor is more likely to lecture and the lecture is likely to matter, although I don't a priori know, know what domains that would be. But, but I'm sure there is an effect. I completely agree. And these are the kind of things where if you want to get a, a data set of 2.1 million students, you go to a publisher, um, but then you don't have access to the kind of demographic data that a university would have. Uh, so there's different, there's different things you can look at in those different cases. Thank you. Thank you all for your questions. Yeah. I think that's a really nice insight, actually, like one of the challenges in doing learning analytics. So we've seen in the learning sciences, and we heard from the speaker this morning, actually, about small data sets and over the years, the things we learned about small groups. And then we talked about big data, and like 2.1 million textbook games is an amazing data set. Uh, but then you start to lose the other aspects, <coughs> like what kind of institution are they enrolled in? That might have a lot to do with yep. this, and other resources available. And I think that's a, a challenge for us as a, a community. Although we could look more what kind of institution they're in. Otto, can you take a note, sir, on looking yeah. at what kind of institution they're in? That could be yeah. relevant yeah. to understanding this more, too. And that's a little easier to get than individual demographics. But I do agree. Uh, as you get larger number of data points, it becomes harder to get larger number of variables, right? There is kind of a trade-off between amount of data per subject and amount of subjects that um, I feel like we're, we're actually moving towards that, that, that happy diagonal more and more over time. I mean, if you look back 10 years ago, all McGraw-Hill would have known was how many textbooks they sold in different cities. They wouldn't have known uh, how many students were or what their grades were, right? Do you think from the data that you have now, you could build a model that would uh, have any reasonable accuracy of predicting who shouldn't be buying the textbook? That is, like, for whom the textbook uh, would be um, not a big lift, given the I mean, textbooks are expensive. I don't, I don't think I would have that data in this data set, but I think that with other data sets, one could conclude that. That would be the kind of thing that you'd want to look at other data, like foreign participation, like grade on first assignment, uh, like probably pr prior class taking would be relevant to that. Um, I mean, I, I do think that relates to that great finding by Purdue course signals years ago where they found that they could actually tell students, hey, you're likely to fill this course no matter what you do, and those students dropped before they actually had to pay without getting a refund. Um, I, I think, yeah. I was going to say about Alex, one of, one of the products that we're working with, it has an, initi an, in an initial assessment, and so it says this is where you are, and then it starts placing you in, in terms of an adaptive, personalized solution through the course. So I think with data like that, You're right, Otto. Not in this platform, but in the Alex platform, that would be very feasible. And I do think there's a certain ethical dimension to don't just take their money if they're going to fail. And, and you know, if you set up a situation, by the way, where if they drop, where you buy the textbook automatically, but if they drop, they get a full refund, then there's no incentive to not have uh, people nudged out if they are really going to fail with a very high probability. And you don't say you have to drop out, but you say, hey, you're in advanced calculus, and it looks like you actually, the last math class you took was developmental algebra, and you got a C. This is probably not the right course for you. Yeah, I have, did, do you know, uh, do you have access to the, the cost of the textbook? Yes. Yeah. I don't know about the problem. Aren't we 
Actually, for yeah. your purposes. So I don't know what the variance is in the cost, but it might be interesting to see if that's another data point you could use. Like if you have textbooks that are forty dollars and then textbooks that are fifty dollars, yeah. is, is there how it affects uh, how it affects and that's yeah. A super suggestion. You know it does, right? <laughs> well, um, well I, I would assume it would affect the number of people actually purchasing the, the right. textbook, but does it affect what, what you were trying to Mike, show? Mike, tease out the procrastination versus the, the, the If you look at uh, curriculum e divide, you have courses that are really important for you go on a lot of courses like uh, people don't understand certain mathematical concepts or don't know how to write in a certain way. So if you look at your uh, line, different types of books, and you could probably find out uh, what types of misconceptions there are there, because the worst, uh, the, the areas where people need more understanding are probably the types of books that they need. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. I like that suggestion. Thank you. It's amazing how many great ideas you can have just on something, a data source this simple, which is why we have such a great conference here. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you.